Hello and welcome to BMA Violet Hour. My name is Tracy Beal and I'm the manager of public programs. And today we have a very special edition of BMA Violet Hour. We're doing something a little bit different. We are featuring painter Shabalala Self and musician, writer, and cultural worker and multidisciplinary artist, Abdu Ali. Earlier this spring, Abdu Ali left Baltimore to go and visit Shabalala Self in her studio in New Haven, Connecticut. Um, while they were there, we actually were able to tag along. We're bringing you with us virtually to be able to get a, a behind the scenes look of Shabalala Self's studio. We'll have a, a look at some of the materials that she works with, as well as some of her processes. We'll hear about how Matisse has influenced her work We'll also talk a little bit about how um, her definition of painting and both Abdu and Shabalala will go in depth about what it means to be a black artist and a, how black artists should work in collaboration. So make sure that you stick around until the end of the video because we're gonna bring Shabalala self and Abdu Ali here live for a live Q and A so that you can join in the conversation. So tonight's program, we just wanna say a nice thank you to uh, Gallery Ava Pressenhuber and Pilar Chorus Gallery for making this this evening's program possible. So let's bring up the video. We need a couple more seconds to bring up the video. Hey, Abdu, Hi. you made it out here. Yes. I'm so happy. Hello, New Haven. Yeah, we're very happy to welcome you here. I know, here we are. Oh, welcome. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So this is it. This is my studio, yeah. This is amazing. This is a lot of space. A lot of space and a lot of stuff. I mean, a lot, a lot of stuff here. You know, I love how messy it is. I love... I know it feels like a playroom, you know, it feels yeah. like a big, big adult version of a playroom. Well, the space that we're in right now generally becomes like my primary workspace. And as you can see, I work primarily on the ground. A lot of the pieces start here. For me, it feels more like building. All these characters feel like they're, they're very much constructed and I'm very much building them. These pieces kind of come together to create these larger forms. And then, you know, and in turn, these larger narratives. A lot of the fabric I actually keep in these large industrial like, laundry bins. I use the word fabric somewhat loosely. It's fabric, but it's literally everything else outside of that and in between. So it can be like old works on paper, like printmaking pieces. It can be other paintings that are deconstructed that were maybe, you know, works that I attempted but failed at. <laughs> when does the actual paint come to you? Like actually using paint, paint versus... Well, I mean... Uh, um, paint versus material. I mean, paint comes into play in different facets. I mean, I also have like a huge drawing practice. Um, these are some examples here of some works. The actual paint that is, you know, where people associate with the paintings comes into place once these different elements, these little applique elements in the paintings are fixed onto a more consistent piece of canvas. That canvas is then stretched. And once the painting is stretched, and I can really treat it more like one with a traditional painting. I love how you start by constructing, constructing your work on the ground, on the bed, in the soil. And then, you know, when they're done and, you know, you feel like they're complete, you raise them up and put them on, you know, a canvas. This ball of fabric is actually really, really fun. It's beautiful, it's functional. I can very easily like pull materials from it. And I actually gotta put a lot of my favorite pieces of material on here. You know, it, I thought it could be cool if you actually like put these in your exhibition. I definitely thought about it, you know? I mean, I th I've definitely thought about ways to make my studio practice more felt in the exhibitions of the work. But I also kind of like that boundary, like there being a mystery to it. So this is a poem that I wrote titled A Mood Conjured by Shaba that is an ode to Shaba. So. 
She uses remains from our past, music from our futures, and gold dust from our legacies to synthesize windows that have eyes as is glass, which beacon light unto our skin, and tongues as is curtains, which sing hello into our ears, and fingers as its frames, which compile notes only our spirits can read, thus creating a pathway to galaxies that when we experience them, set a blaze to our expectations and reupholster and reupholster their truth, to only regurgitate a narrative that will never never ever not betray us and make an offering that allows us to feel as we feel, which is often blue, but black, hard, yet plush, ending as a feeling, as punctuation, into a manifestation of self that is truly God. So Abdul Ali, I've known you now for a couple of years, and mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time out to come up to New Haven from Baltimore. The last time I saw you was when I was in Baltimore and saw my show at the BMA, mm -hmm. and I was in your studio. Yes. So this is your first time here in my studios, Yes. and I appreciate you coming out here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here and like to get and get to see where like you make the work happen where all the magic happens. So it's really nice to be in here. So when you first came in here, like what were some of your impressions? Like what are some of the things that stood out to you the most that maybe you were surprised to see or something you expected to see in my space? Your work being done on the floor. Mm -hmm. I was really surprised to see that. Not because like, oh, art shouldn't be on the floor. Like the fact that you use mixed media, you use all these different textiles and textures in your work, it's kind of like, I can see you like putting together your your paintings like a puzzle. So you remember like making puzzles or playing with puzzles as a kid. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you're doing it on a surface and you're like looking over it. All right. So it's the same kind of logic when kind of putting together these different collage pieces. And the fabric, like my mother collected fabric for like a long time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fabric I have here is like from, you know, a, a good foundational aspect of it is from my family's collection. Also, like older works, like failed paintings, pieces that I was working on and then I didn't appreciate the direction it was going in. And the scrap is really like the foundational aspect of all the work. And this big bundle here, um, I think about it as like an index. Mm -hmm. So many of the textiles that are in this piece, you know, if you look at some of my work, you can recognize the fabrics. And it's, I like having it here because, yeah, it brings me joy. It's kind of like a decorative aspect right. of my studio along with the chairs. The chairs are probably the nicest thing I have yes, in here, other than the work, of course. But, yeah. For you, what is what is painting? You use, you know, different textiles. You're a mixed me media painter. To paint, I don't think you need to use, like, literal paint. I think mm -hmm. you can use literally any material, and it could be in, within any dimension. Two dimension, three dimension. Literal paint is an aspect of my work. Um, right. I do use paint like, in the paintings, mm -hmm. but, yeah, primarily um, I'm using fabric. I'm using objects are things that are of the world because they're already imbued with this like social and cultural significance right. that I can also use in my mind to paint with. Mm -hmm. So if I have a piece of gingham, I mean, that has some kind of cultural context. Right. And I, get, I put that next to a piece of suede that already has oftentimes a, tech, a tactile or a nostalgic association with the average viewer. So putting them next to each other in my mind is the same as putting the color yellow next to purple, mm -hmm. um, maybe causing some kind of friction, it's got some conflation. That's how I really articulate painting. That's how I think about painting. It's more of a philosophy of what does it mean to be in proximity to the other. And conceptually, I think that's why painting also lends itself so well to conversations around identity and identity politics. What happens when one thing is put up next to the other? And I know your exhibition um, at the VMA definitely sp spoke to the idea of like centering process. Um, and for me, when I when I went to the exhibition, I saw your work and I thought about what does process mean? And for me, you know, I just think that it means like always being in this constant state of questioning, always mm -hmm. being, in investigation of something. And so for you, for you, why why is there such an emphasis on just, you know, the process of your work and like the process of creativity? I mean, 
I think I'm so obsessed with the process because I want, I truly want to like build a character, like build a person that represents or exemplifies maybe all your desires, but maybe even all your fears. And then it could be outside of you. So if you're able to then project it or place it outside of yourself, then you can maybe unburden yourself maybe with the neuroses as a, that occur as a result of like that desire in the first place. Or you're trying to create some kind of utopia or some kind of ideal version of um, an individual that you would either want to be in an aspirational sense or who you would hope or wish existed within your right. your actual life. As black people being, you know, in a very, you know, oppressive westernized world and we are often perpetuated as objects versus subject you're speaking to this idea of process allowing space for us to be more self-determined and autonomous over um our identities and how we show up in the world and i think that your work creates you know space for that it also like poses questions of what it means for us to like have you know a sense of self-determination over our identities the more marginalized you are in a society, the more susceptible you are to absorbing the images that are projected onto you. I often felt like when I sought images or I sought representations in the larger society, I was disappointed or not fully satiated with the representations of like black womanhood or femininity that I came across. Right. So I wanted to create more different kinds of images that can circulate and be out in the world. And that was one of the motivators for me to have to, to make art and to make paintings specifically. Do you feel like there still needs to be some work done when it comes to just radicalizing like black womanhood and black woman iconography and, and how it's represented in culture and society? For me, what I hope for is, you know, more nuance and more complexity. Um, like ever, for always and forever, like to keep adding nuance and yes. complexity to these, to these stories. Yes. There's no danger in adding more complexity to a situation potentially. Oh, uh, yeah. Whereas it could be a lot of potentiality for danger if the situa if, a, if a conversation is made to be too narrow. Centering chaos, centering complexity, centering process, centering queerness. You know, queerness as a form of process or process is queerness. It made me think of you know Audre Lorde mm -hmm. and you know um, the the erotic, the uses of the erotic, which is like one of my favorite essays of all time but in that essay she speaks to the fact that you know we need to embrace chaos we need to embrace you know also putting feeling and in, and in, in, into everything that we do but also let's keep you know making things super complicated and like you know making things you know complex and not always try to oversimplify simplify things because I feel like it, it diminishes you know not necessarily our individuality but you know the beautiful complex things that make us fully human you know living and existing in these binaries whether it you know is gender or sexuality etc is very limited for so long people felt like they were gaining um some kind of power or agency through naming through naming themselves. Mm -hmm. I feel like now we're in a different moment, a different headspace culturally, and people are understanding by allowing for the, there to be, um, by allowing yourself to kind of shake these terms and words that have been projected onto you, you can actually enter the, into a space of like more freedom. Mm -hmm. A space that's also closer to truth, mm -hmm. a real actual articulation of who you actually are as an individual. So I understand, I feel like culturally people are shifting towards um, a different way of communicating with one another. And I'm happy that my work is being seen as like maybe a vehicle for some of these conversations to happen. Mm -hmm. Honestly, a lot of these constructs that have been burdensome to all of us cannot be deconstructed with the language or the tools um, that were used to build them. So I understand the need for people to kind of just start fresh from like a new, a new space, right. a new platform. And part a lot of that has to do with language. In the exhibition, the Baltimore Museum of Art exhibition, you created works in response to Matisse's sculpture called Two Women. Mm -hmm. But it was originally called Two Negresses. <laughs> yes, exactly. Oh. Denise Morel writes a lot about this, but um, how, how much or how, how much Black individuals and Black bodies are really involved in what we understand as being like 
you know, Western art history, like these canonical paintings. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's been some a level of erasure that's been a, applied right. to our understanding of this. Like if I was to see the sculptures, I would never know that the muses or the inspirations for the works were, you know, women of African descent. The only clue for that to me was the original titling of the work, True Negresses. And that's what attracted me to the piece. Um, that's what made me interested in kind of diving deeper into the work. And what I found out was that the work is based off a photograph that would have been in one of those, I guess, Parisian, like ethnographic, pseudo pornographic magazines at that time mm -hmm. that featured women from like Western and Northern Africa mm -hmm. and like the Middle East. I really wanted to create works that reimagine the protagonist in the Matisse sculpture, mm -hmm. um, but also works that just unpack the work as it was and kind of very little intervention on my part. And then I wanted to do kind of a radical transformation of the figures as like more modern contemporary woman within a cultural context that felt more familiar to me. So the original work is me doing like a, my initial intervention, um, having both figures face the viewer and be more and interact with one another in a more genuine sense. Right. Um, that's the piece called Two Women, that's in the BMA mm -hmm. show. But the last work, um, Two Women Three, mm -hmm. which I feel like is actually the work that was the most successful, um, both conceptually and formally, shows one woman seated and the other kind of whispering into her ear. You know, for us as Black people, we are hyper visible mm -hmm. in, you know, culture and society in America. And I think it's something really interesting to talk about what it means for us to have secrets. Yeah. For, for ourselves, between ourselves. I also think that the conversation around like Black visibility is, is also more complex because I think Black people are conspicuous, but I don't know if that's necessarily the same as like visible, you know? So I think pe yes, people notice Black people and Black people are often uh, oh, some level of a certain kind of attention is placed on Black people, but I don't know if they're actually truly like seen because I feel like they're right. seen in like, saying. you know, the totality or right. seen as being fully, you know, human. they are, yeah, human, human they are significant then there's a lack of privacy or a lack or a lack of an interest in like the maybe the, in, the the parts of that body or spirit or mind that are not accessible so if i can create space for that in my work it's always a great opportunity for me and that's that's another reason why i felt like the secret or the moment between the two women mm -hmm. that was um kind of only really existed between them what's significant mm -hmm. to have in that painting especially in a, in a in a response to a work like the matisse's two women which is so a work that because of its like erotic nature and because of their womanhood and also because of their like their blackness to make a work that you know could really give kind of put a boundary there i felt like um mm -hmm. was a huge success for me i thought it was interesting in part of the exhibition at the vma the more i guess sexualized pieces that you created were in its own little nook mm -hmm. and room and the room if i remember um, was painted black mm -hmm. traditionally in exhibition spaces and galleries, the walls are white. Well, that room is normally like a black box room that's right. used for the VMA. So they often show films in that space. Me, along with the curator, Cecilia Wichman, we had to really think closely about which works could tell a story um, within that space. And I landed on the diptych carpet, which is very much about desire and an interpersonal dynamic mm -hmm. between the two figures one male, one female, who right. exists in the two separate panels that create them one work. And also, I wanted to include my sculpture there because right. the sculpture was actually made two or three years prior to the painting. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I could create a really interesting story between the two works, especially with the idea of placing the sculpture on a plinth, but on kind of unconventional plinth, using a rug, <laughs> a rug that can also tie in some of the titling of the diptych. Um, so the sculpture rainbow, it kind of shows a woman bending down and you can see her complete backside of her body almost from both sides of the work, which is just kind of pictorially interesting, kind of like an odd mm -hmm. um, take on figuration. Right. Oftentimes in general, my sculptures like lend themselves more towards abstraction than the paintings. Um, but I really appreciate that. I feel like there's a certain kind of poetics that can happen. Um, with that level, when you move away from naturalism, I mean, most people want to consider my work naturalistic, but I have like my own scale within, right. within the studio. <laughs> but mm -hmm. for me, 
the sculptures are on the the lower scale. I would say they right. really lend themselves more towards kind of like experimentation and form. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to imagine that the the figure and the sculpture, mm -hmm. the character was an extension of the woman in the diptych, um, and I wanted to imagine that whole entire nook in the exhibition as being a small intimate space, an interior space, a domestic space. Um, and in that regard, trying to really explore the dynamics between these two characters, explore the dynamics of a home, of a relationship, intimacy. Right, okay. And so that room, I think, truly like evokes a lot of those ideas and themes, and um, this visually speaks to that as well. And from what I've heard from you and from other people that I've seen the show, they get that kind of energy when they enter into the space as well. And mm -hmm. the space can only really accommodate one person at a time, too. Right. So that's also, all those feelings are mm. magnified as well. Mm -hmm. The show is titled By Myself. Yeah, Shabalala Self, By, by myself. myself. But Myself is like two words instead of one. Now, when you say <laughs> by myself, are you talking about literally you by yourself? Or are you talking about, because I feel like, you know, with the works, especially a lot of the works being these miscue, conjoined figures that involve, you know, maybe more than you know multiple limbs you know more than one head i get this sense of like you are also like kind of making a statement um that you know our identities are you know contain like multi universes of different um of other people's experiences and also like you know we are literally like a combination of like our ancestors and mm -hmm. even genetically how you know i i do believe that we carry memory and ideas you know within our dna so for me you know by myself also kind of speaks to like the fact that myself is ourself i mean the tiling again i was it's somewhat of like a poetics slightly like nonsensical and playing on your name and playing on my name of course i am somewhat of a loner um, I'm very much in my own head and my work is an extension of me articulating all these different facets of my own self. For me, completely alone in my studio because I have access to all of my ideas fully in every facet of myself outside of a performative, um, outside of any kind of performative way because I'm by myself. <laughs> I feel like I have a certain kind of calm and reassurance from like my figures, my work, the characters. So I feel like I'm almost surrounded. And I'm hoping that viewers can go into that space. They can find com community um, with the figures and really have a transformative experience there. So do you feel like when it comes to, because I feel like you make a lot of space for your figures as if like they're actual people, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like you're in not only in conversation with your figures and also the materials that you use, but you're also in collaboration with mm -hmm. your figures. What does it mean, I guess, for you just to center collaboration within your practice in general? Because, you know, me and you, we've been in conversation in collaboration for for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I feel like um, for me, I think that it's very important for us, especially as Black young artists, to mm -hmm. collaborate and not just even with other artists within our similar similar disciplines, but I think it's even more important for like a visual artist to collaborate with a writer, to collaborate with, you know, a music artist and, you know, just keep being in dialogue and, and with each other in, in pursuit of I guess, you know, creativity, but also like uh, mining for like nuances and, 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 you know, new discoveries when it comes to intellect and knowledge as well. I think the center collaboration um, articulates to, you know, a larger group of people or can say to all the people who, are, who, you, who you are hoping to share your work with or who you see yourself as being peers with or in communication with that, hey, like I'm showing that I support and I respect like the practice of this fellow artist, this fellow, fellow maker, and that we are working together to further a narrative that's important to both of us. I feel like it's important to state that publicly. And I think through, through collaboration, yeah. you show that. And it's not, you're not just stating it, you're showing through action. I think that's very, very important for especially for Black artists to do that. Mm -hmm. Because so often um, Black artists are made to feel like they're competing over resources with one another wow. or space you know, time, like a whole number, a host of things. But to collaborate with one another, you're, you're showing through action that 
you want to uplift one another and that you're creating community with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important political gesture to make. Mm -hmm. And I think people underestimate the political nature of that kind of gesture. It's an act of resistance against anti-Blackness, especially when mm -hmm. it comes to um, the fact that, you know, this idea of capitalism and competitiveness, I think often creates a energy of anti-Blackness towards, you know, each other as Black artists. And I think, like you said, making space to not just be like, oh, I love this artist, I want to support them, but no, we're going to also make work together. We're also going to be in dialogue with each other. I feel like it creates space for like us to have ownership and autonomy over like what we what we validate and what mm -hmm. we don't. Hopefully that spirit, the spirit of collaboration will you know continue to grow within the arts community. Um, I feel like it was something that was very, very important in the past, especially in like different arts movement, black arts movement. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you think about uh, one of the most notable ones, like the Harlem Renaissance, and thinking about the yeah. importance of collaboration, mm -hmm. um, holding space with one another, publicly um, stating affiliation. That was a that was a, a important, and a, I would love to see that coming back I, into play. I also feel like it creates a space for us to be critical with each other, for each other, by each other, with only each other, you know? And yes. I think that even, you know, in the age of, you know, YouTube and Black Twitter, I feel I still feel like we need to create space and platforms for Black criticality in the arts. And I think that collaboration and being in conversation with each other definitely is a step in that direction of creating more autonomy over um Black crit criti criticality over Black art. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, I feel like there needs to be more platforms that are by us and for us. And I agree, like creating a space for collaboration will foster a healthier, you know, environment within the Black arts community, an environment that feels um, people can understand that they're in co conversation with one another, they're in community with one another. And that will provide a certain feeling of safety. And within that safety can come a safe space for needed um, and responsible criticism, you know, and everyone's practice can grow from critique. So it would be great to feel like there was a space where um, the work can be understood um, from a cultural perspective, um, conceptual, formal perspective, and it could be spoken about right. and discussed and truly unpacked. Right. Um, yeah. So I 100% agree with you there. Yeah, because criticality is uh, an act of or form of care because it's constructive mm -hmm. criticism. And, you know, we definitely need that type of care within our work to help elevate it. What What is important for you to see happen in the future when it comes to, you know, radicalizing the creative ecosystem within the Black arts world? Mainly what I want to happen is that people feel like whatever they want to happen is possible. So for like all the young black artists that are, you know, hoping to start showing their work or get more recognition for their work, I want them to feel like they have full agency to make anything happen for themselves and that nothing is not attainable to them because of how they're perceived or how they're understood or what's mm -hmm. expected from them. So basically just to have like more freedom and for artists to have more autonomy um, and expression and how they move, how they conduct themselves, how they run their studio, like everything. Um, so basically for people to be able to enter into the creative fields and have the confidence and the reassurance that they can make anything happen for themselves, not gonna be kind of barriers um, put up, roadblocks put up that's preventing them from attaining the kinds of positions, opportunities that they want. That's what I really want to see happen. And, and that's something that I'm hoping, you know, people can can have, you know, not even think about something that they can just take for granted. That's what I hope will happen next mm -hmm. within like the black arts community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would love to see, you know, just more sanctuaries where, you know, black artists can not only be beacon, young black artists, emerging black artists can not only be beacon, but also, you know, mentored and, you know, given, you know, resources to help them grow and just really nourish their talent. Like, I always dream, you know, one of my biggest dreams is to see like, you know, a HBCU that's like, you know, specifically for black black artists just like an art school that is a hbcu or you know even more 
black owned galleries and black owned museums, you know, more just sanctuary spaces, black, you know, creative educational spaces, et cetera, that really help raise up like the next generation, you know, beyond just putting a spotlight on, like really giving them the tools and the resources they need to like become, you know, legendary. 100%. Yeah. I mean, everybody wants that opportunity, mm-hmm. for sure, yeah. to leave, leave a mark and to leave a legacy and to really have a chance to have their ideas um, really proliferate in the society as a whole. I really appreciate you coming here today. Yeah. And, like, giving me the me. opportunity to get a lot of things off my chest and, like, share <laughs> part of my studio, my practice, yeah. with a larger audience. You've always been here as, like, really a muse to me oh, to help, like, you. pull ideas, like, Deep ideas that have been really deep in my mind out. So I really appreciate time and I appreciate you taking the time to get to know me as a person and as a fellow like artist and creator. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your studio. I mean, it's such an honor to be, you know, in your studio to see how, you know, your work is developed and to come to the place where, you know, it's your sanctuary and, and gathering your thoughts and your creative ideas. So it's definitely an honor to be here and, you know, to be in New Haven. And yeah, just to again continue being in conversation with you because I think it's not just important for our practice and our work, but also just you know it's important for like just the culture and you know our community, our Black creative community as well, to see these type of conversations, you know, that is between two Black artists for us by us. So yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hello? Hello. Oh, we're in. <laughs> I, was like, I didn't realize we was on stage. Okay, we're here. Hey, everyone. How are you feeling? I feel good. Yeah, it's just been in the studio all day. So um, it's nice to get some interactions. I'll talk yeah. to <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. That was so cool to watch. You know, that was my first time watching it all the way through straight like when we were looking at it you know in the draft phase that it was in um i didn't i never watched it all the way through i always watched it a little bit and stopped came back a lot lot. it was really um cool to watch all the way through this time yeah i'm really happy to see it again um and it's exciting to be able to share it tonight with the audience um like you mentioned before when we were kind of planning the whole thing it's kind of been a great opportunity to kind of, you know, have a studio visit or kind of talk about an art practice mm-hmm. outside of the normal, um, you know, the, the normal dynamics to have like a fellow artist and reach out to another. Um, so I think it's something that's been super generative and something I would like to continue within my studio and things, something I think other artists should do as well. Yeah, it, I just feel like, like, you know, when I, what I was saying in the video, I don't think people understand how crucial it is for us to be um, in in public forum with each other, to be in conversation, to be in dialogue with each other. I feel like that's one of the things I really don't see with all the great black talent that you see on Instagram and YouTube, and you see a lot of content. I just feel like we don't see a lot of criticality or critique behind the work, nor do we see just artists talking about their work, talking with each other about not even just to work their lives, who are you? <laughs> like, you know? Um, and I feel like it's so, so important, you know? Um, I'm very inspired by Ellis Hazlip, the creator and producer of Soul, which was a public television um, show, came out in the late 60s and early 70s. That was It was basically given PBS in the studio slash performance art, you know, talk show type of programming. And the famous interview that a lot of people love to retweet on Twitter and Instagram of Nikki Giovanni and James Baldwin was on that show. 
And you know, Hellas Hazlip was an openly black gay male. And this was his show. And he created that space for them to talk, you know, um, on stage publicly, uh, publicly in front of the world on TV. And, you know, we get a lot out of those conversations that we see from back in the day. And I think that today in 2021, we might not feel the urgency to produce, but, you know, the space for that and to produce that type of content because we see each other so much. But I think we need to realize that it, a lot of that type of content do not exist and we need more of it, whether it's ephemeral or long lasting. 100%. Yeah, I think people underestimate how important these kinds of conversations are, um, not even just in the moment, but more thinking long term for posterity, for sure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, everyone, I hope you guys like the video. Um, let us know your thoughts in the chat. And also, please do not be hesitant to send us a question. So we're going to read, we're going to talk, we're going to talk casually, candidly. Um, but also, we would love for you, you all to interject with your own questions or thoughts so we can, you know, have a more vibrant, fuller conversation. So please send your questions in the chat. But Tracy asked the question for you, Chaba. Um, do you create? Do you create your with the viewer by with the viewer in mind, or have an idea what the viewer think for feel after, after experiencing your work? Um, I would say that I do not generally make work with the viewer in mind. Um, I feel like that ultimately would be like distracting. So when I'm working, I'm generally just trying to contend with the formal issues in any given work. Mm -hmm. So I kind of start a work with an idea. And then the what I'm mainly focusing on from the point of the idea, um, which is like the conception of the work to the completion of the work is just how is this going to function as like a painting or a sculpture or a drawing, like making sure that it's making sense within the context of its medium. Um, and towards the end, maybe once a work is like mostly resolved or complete, that's at the point in which I think about, okay, how will this make sense with an exhibition space? Or how will this make sense in relation to other works that is being shown next to or in proximity to? And in those moments, that's when um, I first start to think about like the viewer. But it's not so much thinking about the viewer in terms of like their expectations for the work, but more so thinking about how the viewer will experience the work and how I can communicate a larger story or narrative around this discrete work or a body of works through how they're kind of placed in relation to one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was thinking about do I, I think with making music, I think you kind of have to be forced to consider what the listener um, might think of the work. Because um, for me, music is a very call and response type of medium or a very just, you know, a medium that I feel like as a music and a performer wouldn't be a medium at all without the audience, period. You know, the audience is so important to the work that I do. Um, so I'm always thinking about I guess to listen or to receive it of my works. Um, and there's another question. This one's for you. When was the first time you saw the sculpture that was formerly called Two Negresses in a book at the museum? And do you immediately think that you would respond to it in your own work? Um, so if I'm remembering correctly, the first time I encountered the work was when I went to the BMA for one of my first site visits and included in my site visit was like a tour of their archive, um, specifically the Matisse collection, mm -hmm. because that was one of the main, because you know, the BMA has like the largest collection of Matisse works, um, I really wanted to have my exhibition kind of respond to that. Um, so when I went to the BMA, I was kind of doing all this research on Matisse and do going through, I think it was his like, um, the huge catalogs and images. I came across this one work 
And I believe I had seen the work before and mm -hmm. I liked it, but it didn't really strike me um, until I saw it with this original title, which was a two negresses. And of course it struck me because um, I, it became obvious that this work was of two black women. And that you know, majority of my practice is dedicated to the black female body. So um, I saw this as, it was interesting for two ways. For one, I was like, oh, this could be a point of departure for me to make a work that's in direct relationship or directly related to one of the works that's held in the museum's collection. But also too, it, it kind of highlighted in my mind like how much I never even considered the possibility of there being like black figures involved in like Matisse's practice. Um, even though I knew, um, even though I knew like on a um, intellectual level that there were <laughs> because of readings I've done and research I've done, it's just still emotionally it struck me like, oh wow. Um, but yeah, for, it really struck me as something I, I was mostly drawn in by the titling. And I, you know, at that moment, I decided to dedicate more energy and time into researching that work specifically. And it ended up becoming a big part of my exhibition. Um, I ended up making three works in response to it. And those are the three mm -hmm. works encounter first when they enter it into the BMA show. Right. Do you feel like he knew the figures that he were, that he were, um, making in that piece of work do you feel like he knew them personally like was it you think it was a personal reference like people like two women that he actually knew personally well for that work they weren't it uh, there's like a source image um which is a photograph from like these kinds of um periodicals that were really popular in france at the time they were, mm -hmm. were um these kind of orientalist like pseudo photographic images of women yeah. Middle East, North Africa, West Africa, who are mostly nude. Um, so the image, there's an image in one of these magazines that dates the time close to um, the moment in which the sculpture was made that our historians believe was the inspiration for the work. But um, after reading um, Denise Morel's writings, um, specifically in her book, I think it's entitled Framing Modernity, um, Right. There were other models that Matisse did have a relationship with that were friends or acquaintances that he did have in his studio that were of African descent. So there were other models and muses in his practice that were people that he did know um, in real life that were mm -hmm. women, who were Parisian women at the time. Um, so do you feel like that shifts the spectrum between voyeurism and admiration? I mean, I think it's so complicated, you know? Mm -hmm. And I have no, I have no way of really knowing. It's like you have to, it's such a pers it's such a personal thing. Like you, right, why, why he, um, it's such a personal. It would have to be such a personal thing as like why he chose to recreate this work, um, especially mm -hmm. recreate it as it's as a sculpture. What is a two dimensional work as a photograph, a source image? Um, okay. But if I had to guess, given the context of the um, the source image, the original photograph. I would say that it was maybe more of a voyeuristic pursuit because mm -hmm. it was coming out of this more um, like sexual, it was more of a sexualized image coming out of this very like kind of, you know, like the borderline photographic periodical mm -hmm. from that time. So, so do you feel like your pieces are working in tandem with his or do you feel like your piece is more so, your pieces are more so detached from him, but just like existing in their own Round, wow. if that makes sense. I, I, and I kind of approached the sculpture three different ways, three different times. So, um, I feel like each work is doing something different. Mm -hmm. One work is me trying to simply just reimagine the sculpture um, by making like small interventions, having both figures face the viewer, um, having both figures make eye contact with the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, that's the original work, Two Women, that's like in the center of the three at the BMA exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, there's the one that was made after that, which is really just like a recreation, very matter of fact recreation of the original piece. And for me, that was an experiment to see if I was to just recreate it, if that alone, if mirroring the work, but just mirroring the work, given my own identity politic, if that alone was enough to transcend it, you know, allowed to transcend it's like original like um implications mm -hmm. <laughs> it was more of a kind of a social experiment from my perspective um i can't say that just me redoing the work as myself did that 
Um, but the work that I'm the most proud of, and I think is the most interesting and the work that contributes something that's the most unique and fresh is the last work, which is Two Women Three, which is like a complete reimagining of the figures as like contemporary women, as women who have a real relationship to one another, um, as opposed mm -hmm. to models who are like posing together, um, who have this kind of like vague um, dynamic. So, um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was really just an experimentation. It was much harder, too, than I thought it was going to be, you know, continuing with this work. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I was just thinking about the Black world. The room is just painted with Black walls mm -hmm. and the works that exist in that room. Um, made me think about, like, <laughs> this is but, but it made me think about, like, you know, how you go in maybe an adult film theater and it's all dark and black. Like, did you want it to have that type of seductive, provocative feeling as you enter in it? Because, you know, I mean, it's such a drastic, not drastic, but dramatic contrast and shift from, you know, the rest of the show. And then you go into this room that's painted all black. Did you want that prov provocative kind of like sneaky link energy <laughs> to like come into the space? Well, that room is the is like a black box theater normally. Right. So right. Um, that impression of it is like completely accurate because generally it's showing like moving images and it's painted the black to kind of facilitate like better visibility of those kinds of works. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I wanted to use this space as a painting room for the show. Right. But it already had this infrastructure to it that was like inherent, it's like the black walls. This kind of is already somewhat secluded from the rest of the exhibition spaces. So I wanted, I this is instead of working trying to contend with that, I just figured I had to lean into it in terms of like the kinds of works I showed in the space, and um, the kind of the you know the curation of the room, like the position of the works in relation to one another. Um, Did you have a name for that room, like a? Like for those bodies of works, like a series type of name. It I don't have a name for them, but they no. all they all kind of center around this carpet. So that the carpet, right, 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 right. You know, domestic object is maybe the link between all three. Um, I guess it three. It's really only two works. Well, maybe three. There's the wall painting, which is a work. Yeah, for sure. And then there's the diptych. Um, which is a, it, it, that, that is that name is just so you know sonically yeah. performative. <laughs> yeah. So that that work has like the two panels, one work with two panels, and then there's the sculpture of rainbow, and that's mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another object which I wouldn't really describe as a discrete work. Um, it's something that kind of goes along with rainbow. It's a carpet which is functioning as the plinth um, right. at the exhibition space. Yeah. Um, and the purpose of the carpet was that, you know, I wanted, I wanted to ground the sculpture. Not that it needs to be grounded; it's very heavy, very, very heavy piece. But I wanted to kind of like ground it. Um, but I didn't want to put it on this more traditional uh, exhibition object, like you know, white plant. I wanted to put it on something which I felt like evoked some of the ideas in the painting. So I made this custom carpet for it. Um, so it does the right. job of highlighting the work, creating distance from viewers, but also it's allowing it to sit in space um, in a way that's different than what I've seen before. Um, sculptures being handled and exhibitions. Right. Do you feel like those pieces also have like a comedic flair to it? I feel like for some reason it's giving me com comedic flair, not like, you know, you know, I don't know, stand up with Martin Lawrence and that like that, like not 90s comedic flair, actually more so um shoot i just had it in my head like the comedy that we kind of saw and i know this is you know this movie is definitely not a comedy the color purple <laughs> but with um oh my god the singer oh my god i'm i'm having a brain fart the singer in uh that was that kind of had a lesbian relationship with Whoopi goldberg's character so you're thinking about maybe her her persona the tongue tongue in cheek yeah, she was very punk and she, she was a, she was very, you know, sultry and powerful, but at the same time, there was this like comedic factor to her. 
you know, this like tongue in cheek factor to her. And I feel like her essence, I feel like of comedy or comic relief is imbued in the works that you created for that run. Well, I should Suge, have- Suge Avery, Avery. Yes. Yes. I love figures like Suge in general. I, I find them to be, I feel like that's a trope, kind of like the, um, I feel like it's a trope that exists within like black American femininity. It's like the transgressive female, the woman mm-hmm. who is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unwedded, unattached. Um, they are acting and performing in a way that is different than every other female in the space. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing as well about a character like Suge is that the way she's spoken about is generally, she's like disparaged very much throughout the film. She's thought to have a like a dirty woman, this is a, she's alluded to her being alcoholic. Um, her, she has no, she's not really rooted anywhere. She's like this artist that's like been traveling and and then also she has this relationship with, with Whoopi Goldberg's character, which mm-hmm. is something that's often seen as a transgress a transgression in that time, in that moment. Right. Well, in the actual book written by Alice Walker, as we all know, mm-hmm. they actually have a like a full on relationship. Like is is concrete and transparent that they're actually in a lesbian relationship. And they open up a business and the the paint the trouser business <laughs> right 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 in the book is the book in general like most things is way more in depth real yeah. and in depth and explicit i guess you know your work always also makes me think of i feel like you are a child of this person zora neil hurston not this person this icon and no, I love zora neil hurston. yeah i feel like yeah so are you what's your relationship with her and 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 yeah and and her work. I mean, I guess the thing I love the most about Zora Neale Hurston was her, um, like, her anthropological um, approach to like documenting Black American vernacular, like in terms of like even like the speech, like how it sounds and how it's written. And this is something that um, I've been looking or thinking about a lot, a lot more recently um, on a in relation to our project that I'm I'm developing in the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm for Performa, which is happening in October this year. Um, I put together this like yeah. non-linear play, mm-hmm. and I'll be thinking a lot about language and how language sounds and like kind of our art- articulation of certain words and terms that is nice. um, within like a Black American vernacular. And yeah. I've been thinking a lot about Zora Neale writings, like um, Zora Neale Hurston's writing, and also just her like her anthropological work in regard to that. Right, Eatonville. Yeah. Shout out to Eatonville, Florida. <laughs> yeah, and it's something that I've thought about before too in terms of the paintings. Like a lot of my paintings, the titling comes from my like terms, I think, um, can have this like a double entendre. They have this right. kind of meaning, a general meaning, or they get appear to have this general meaning and just, I guess, mainstream society, but then they have this more nuance or double meaning that's specific to like a, a Black American vernacular. Um, yeah, you know, have you, you had, if you haven't, you have to read our play. That's in the zine file, you know, which was inspired, inspired, it, it fire inspired my last album. But in that zine or magazine, um, she wrote this amazing play called Color Struck. Have you read it? No, I haven't. All right, I'm gonna send it to you because you gotta read it. You will like it. But yeah, I mean, like those are. I mean, her, Alice Neal, like these are all writers um, and thinkers that I think about often. Um, and this diversity of characters that they've created um, as it relates to like black, black femininity is something that I find inspiring and something that I feel like it's still not, I feel like even despite the work and foundations that they have built to create more variation within, um, I guess, the images or the personas that are allowed to exist in um, culture at large, these are, it's still not so much space for these these um, kinds of figures to proliferate. Like, so I'm trying to contribute to that and making characters that are as complex mm-hmm. as, as many of the figures in their novels and plays and writing. Yes, so we have a few questions in the chat, but yeah, y'all keep sending you know those questions and we need more questions. Stop being shy. <laughs> but, um, wait, where are we? What are what are the two of you working on now? 
Um, <laughs> I had to think about it because I feel like I've been doing so much, so many little things. Um, right now, I haven't really been working on music that much during the pandemic. Um, I'll be right. I've been redirecting my energy towards cultural work as a lay, um, which is a platform I created in 2019 that centers critical dialogue, collaboration, and digital media. And what has come out of that is a few exhibitions, um, mostly virtual, and a few collaborative art pieces like. Through As They Lay, I collaborate with other artists to usually make video work and sound work. Um, again, because I think that it's so important for us not just to be in dialogue with each other, but also make work together, you know? Um, and so I've been focusing on elevating that platform and I've been doing some scoring work, scoring work um, on, on the side as well. So yeah, I haven't really been, Making any music, I think I'm about to get into that groove again because the pandemic wore me out. I couldn't do it, <laughs> but yeah, that's what I've been working for, working, um, working on. So, as they lay, follow as they lay on Instagram and stay updated with those projects. But yeah, what have you been working on? Um, it's mostly just been performa, um, just preparing for that for the fall. It's been quite a big endeavor putting on the production because I'm um, having to work with like more people than I'm generally used to working with. Like in my studio, it's just me, mm -hmm. one or two assistants, but mm -hmm. there are actors, there's the whole production team. You have dealing with people who are fabricating on stage, props. So it's been something much bigger than I've done before, but it's been actually super exciting because I'm able to collapse so many different interests that I that I have, like I generally have, or things that I've wanted to do that I haven't been able to do before. Um, this has been a perfect context to kind of debut them. Many things that actually relate, that kind of are more on the periphery of design and art. Um, so like furniture design or costume. Mm, yes, please make some furniture. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, things I haven't done before, but the performer has, you know, giving me a platform and an opportunity to finally make these kinds of objects. So it's been very exciting. Yes, yes, because I need, I need, I need you to do that so I can buy some shit to put in my house. But we got one more question, and this last question is: uh, Is there anything you're looking forward to creatively in Baltimore and New Haven now that the world's slowly opening up? And I think it's really important for us to talk about, you know, what our dreams are, or what our aspirations for the communities we exist in. So for me, um, in Baltimore, I want us to see more exhibitions of black visual art. Um, and, and also, I guess more programming, like I want to see a lot more programming rooted in Thought abundance, uh, thought abundance, um, creative abundance, and that kind of mix up like space, space for dialogue, but also performance and art exhibition. Like I want to see more, more multi-dimensional programming around art in Baltimore because I think we definitely, definitely need it. And yeah, I can't wait to perform again, which probably won't be for a while. So that's what I'm looking forward to. What about you? I same here, like definitely looking forward to being in a you know space of lots of people listening to music, seeing art. Um, looking forward to the art institutions opening up back here in New Haven, some of the music venues, concert venues for sure. Um, yeah, I'm just like looking forward to things kind of returning to normal. And I think that they are. I think everyone's kind of on that. We got it. We got it. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I think, I think that things are heading in the right direction. So. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think that we got to continue to not just be, you know, making stuff together and being in conversation with each other. But I want us to collaborate on some type of event or something, too. Maybe it can be something that happens both in New Haven or um, Hudson and Baltimore. But I feel like we should curate like an actual, like pro, like you know, event together. I don't know what it could look like, but I feel like we need to take you know this energy into the real 
the real world. A lot of people don't know, actually, Shaba brought me to Hudson for an amazing performance at this event. She curated card uh, Free Range, and it was lit. <laughs> It was a really good time. And yeah. I'm on it now, actually. It's really big. So, yeah, I want us to keep doing stuff like that. For sure. I mean, we'll, things will, the world's, you know, opening back up. And it's going to be more, I think, more opportunities now than maybe there, there were even before. People are so excited to get back to seeing one another. Yeah. I have appreciation for it, you know. I appreciate you. This was a beautiful conversation. And I can't wait until the world sees that video that you know we all worked on together. So yeah, um, tonight was cute. <laughs> Thank you, Abdul. Your time, Thank you. energy for sure. Thank you, and thanks everyone for joining us and tuning in. Follow us on the gram or whatever. Stay, stay connected. You know, yeah. That was awesome, y'all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, Abdu Ali, Shabala Self. This has been a great process, just putting this together with you all. And the conversation was amazing. I feel like we, you, you hit on a lot of different subjects that I think we haven't had a chance to hear, you know, before this, you know, from either of you. Um, and the rapport between the both of you definitely shines through. So. Wow. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I just also just want to thank the folks at the BMA. I um, want to thank the, the galleries that definitely made this whole thing possible. I want to thank um, Gallery Ava Pressenhoover, also uh, the Pilar Corias Gallery um, for making this whole thing possible. And Abdu and Shava, this was absolutely awesome. I don't think people know that you actually, you did a lot of production work on this as well. Yeah. You, you did some direction and production on this. So. <laughs> You definitely shaped the did that. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again. And for everybody else that's watching, you can follow the Baltimore Museum of Art on our website at artbma.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We are everywhere. So thanks for tuning in. And we'll see you for the next BMA Violet Hour program. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.